Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. And uh, uh, happy Easter. It's a great time remembering what our good Lord has done for us and, uh, and appreciating this time in which we celebrate His death and resurrection. And uh, make sure you tell somebody around you uh, that He has risen. It's a very important time. It's an important, I think it's an exciting time to, to have someone here sharing his conversion story with us uh, in reflection on, on the meaning of this in his life. Uh, our guest tonight is Dr. John Bergsma, former Christian Reformed minister. He'll, he'll describe a little bit what it means to be Christian and Reformed uh, in the background of that. But uh, you're an essential part of the program. If you'd like to give us a call, please do so at 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, you can give us a call at 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email, journeyhome at EWTN.com. Dr. John. Great welcome, to be here, Marcus. Welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. The biggest problem with the Journey Home is time flies way too fast I because know. there's so much I would love you to talk about in the program. I always begin, though, by getting out of the way and invite the guest sure. to give us a little summary of your okay. spiritual background. Sure, well, uh, I was the fifth child, am the fifth child, <laughs> okay, of a uh, Navy chaplain. Uh, my dad was a uh, Christian Reformed minister. Now the Christian Reformed denomination is one of the uh, Dutch Calvinist uh, denominations, of which there are several mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, so my dad went to the Navy um, and uh, exercised his ministry there. Uh, I was born in Hawaii in uh, Pearl City, overlooking uh, Pearl Harbor, and um, uh, fifth child of my parents. And uh, we grew up all over, uh, largely outside of our denominational uh, home bases. Uh, I grew up going to Navy chapels and to Baptist churches off, off the base. Uh, had a wide variety of experiences there. We lived in uh, uh, Hawaii, New Jersey, <laughs> Connecticut, uh, California. Uh, maybe some other place I'm forgetting at the moment. But uh, anyway, um, uh, just charting out my spiritual, uh, my spiritual journey, you know, there's some high points that stick out. Uh, although in the Dutch Calvinist tradition, we didn't uh, uh, emphasize uh, the prayer to receive Jesus that, that is emphasized in a lot of American churches. Um, uh, s some churches that we went to emphasized that. So when I was about eight years old, I prayed to receive Jesus uh, right outside my Sunday school um, uh, classroom on the naval base uh, there, and I believe that was Quantico, uh, Virginia at the time. And uh, that was a tremendous spiritual milestone. I, I know the Holy Spirit had been active in me prior to that, um, but just that, uh, that act of self-giving to Jesus was uh, uh, a real special uh, okay, but not common amongst all Christian reform. No, no, we didn't. We didn't emphasize that. We ch practiced child uh, uh, infant baptism and um, uh, encouraged people at about age 18 uh, mm -hmm. to make profession of faith uh, when they would declare themselves to be uh, part of the part of the church. And uh, that's usually when we really called for that personal that mm -hmm. personal commitment. But, uh, but I made that prayer at eight years old, and when I was about 12, my mom started me on um, uh, the walk through the Bible. Um, oh, sure. I don't know, you remember these? Uh, yep. Yep. Maybe it's uh, reading through the Bible in a year, and uh, I, I really attribute that to the fact that I later became a Bible scholar. Um, she started me off doing that uh, at about age 12. And um, when I was in high school, which was back in Hawaii, um, I had a wonderful youth pastor. Uh, who took myself and three other uh, young men out of the youth group, and uh, he started to disciple us. Uh, he had us uh, uh, read a, um, uh, a book called The Master's Plan of Evangelism and um, some other devotional literature, and that whole experience with uh, 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 the, mm. the personal formation, I would call it formation now, um, really drove home to me the, the importance of discipleship and what, what we as Catholics would call spiritual direction. So it planted a seed in me for the rest of my life that I should always be in spiritual direction, always under spiritual authority, always having somebody guiding me. And I, uh, that's a principle that I hold to to this day. Um, 
So in, in high school, yeah, as I said, I had this wonderful uh, youth pastor. Uh, at the end of high school, I had a lot of options open to me because I had done well in school. Uh, I could have gone to the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and <laughs> gone into engineering for free. They were wanting me to come and pay my tuition. Uh, but, and I had other options, the CIA, all the different things I was thinking of doing. <laughs> and uh, I prayed to the Lord to give me guidance, and the answer came back from the Lord. If you really think you can do anything, why not uh, the, the hardest and most important? And uh, that, that for me meant the ministry like my father had gone into. <laughs> so just before applying to colleges, I decided, you know what, uh, I want to go to seminary, I want to be a minister, I want to be like my dad, I want to preach the Word of God. Uh, so I only applied to our denominational college because that was where we needed to go in my denomination to get trained. So I went there, uh, studied Greek uh, because uh, I needed to read the New Testament. And uh, in, in college, I was very active in InterVarsity uh, Christian yeah. Fellowship. I was the president of the uh, chapter at, uh, at Calvin College. I enjoyed that very much. Got a lot of uh, um, spiritual direction, we would call it, mm -hmm. through them. Um, met my wife uh, in college, uh, uh, got married, um, and then I went into seminary, uh, planning to be a minister. Uh, well, after a year of seminary, they sent me out on what we call summer assignment. So I went off to Edmonton, Alberta, and I, I was the student pastor of this church. Marcus, it didn't go very well. <laughs> in fact, it went awfully. And I came back uh, to Michigan, and uh, I, I left the seminary. I thought, this is not for me. I have no gifts for preaching. Um, and I, I went into a depression, because here I had spent all my life preparing to minister the, to the Word of God. And, uh, and here I find out this is just is not, not for me. So I was down and out doing janitorial work just to keep us afloat. And we had a baby coming, uh, which uh, was kind of a surprise to us. And uh, in downtown uh, Grand Rapids, and uh, I was going to this small mission church, uh, very ethnically diverse, African American, Caucasian, Hispanic, which is unusual in our denomination, which is mostly <laughs> Dutch, uh, Dutch American, and uh, going to this this little church, and we lost our pastor, and they didn't have money to hire a, a fully ordained man, um, but I had a license from from our denomination to conduct religious services, and they said, John, you're you're right here. Why don't you step in? Uh, and fill in for a while. Well, I did that, and then a, a while became more or less permanent. So <laughs> I was the acting pastor of this, uh, of this uh, uh, mission church uh, for four years, which is a wonderful, wonderful experience, and taught me a lot about what the church is on a very mm. personal level by doing door-to-door -door evangelism and personal discipleship, um, crisis intervention, jail ministry, all the different things that come up in a, uh, a lower-income um, uh, urban ministry, and um, that gave me a real experience of what the church is like. Well, tour, uh, I finished up my seminary degree part-time while I was doing this church work, and um, uh, at that point, when I finished the degree, I had the option of going and taking a, a fully established church rather than this little um, mm. uh, mission church I was working at, uh, or possibly I could go on to grad school. And I was having some some difficulties uh, with the theology of my denomination, trying to understand how everything fit together, um, uh, uh, how sola scriptura worked, uh, whether it did work. Uh, these are kind of intellectual questions that were coming up to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided, rather than to, to take a church in my denomination, to apply to graduate schools and see if I could study the Bible more. I wanted to maybe be a professor of Bible at our seminary. You know, that, that was, uh, I guess that was the plan in the back of my head. And, uh, and also buy myself some time to think through some issues. Hmm. And uh, I did that. I got accepted to the University of Notre Dame, which I didn't even realize was only two hours south of us. <laughs> uh, never realized that. I knew it was somewhere in the country and it was associated with football. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know it was Catholic? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I realized that. I thought, well, they, you know, Catholics do study the Bible, so maybe they have a, a, a Bible department, you know. And, and sure enough, they did. I got online and checked out. Sure enough, they did. And um, so I applied there. I got accepted uh, into, the, uh, into the doctoral program of Bible, and, and that's where I got my degree. In, uh, All right. So, yeah. uh, the audience may not know. Some of the audience may not know the background of the of CRC. And I think sure. uh, I, I thought it'd be interesting to point out, for me, have you point out? Um, I mean, it was a, it's one of the stricter of the right. Calvinist branches, right? Right. That's true. 
especially when it came to things like predestination sure. and understanding total depravity, the, 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 the right. tulip. Right, right. tulip. Very yeah. strict on that, right? Yeah. Well, traditionally it has been. Uh, I think in my generation that's you know, changing. It's becoming mm -hmm. more like uh, the rest of what we call, you know, just general evangelical Protestant denominations. So that those, those distinctives of strict Calvinist doctrine are, are not emphasized the way they were, say, when my father uh, was trained uh, mm -hmm. as a pastor in, 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 the, uh, in the denomination. But it still tends to be um, more conservative in the spectrum of American churches, uh, pro-life, um, uh, pro-family, uh, emphasizing the need to accept Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. Um, so uh, th those those basic uh, evangelical characteristics quite strong. Right, quite yeah. strong on that. Yeah, I mean, very. Sure. I mean, really, your particular branch of the Reformed Church, the more conservative, that mm -hmm. had broken away from a previous right. one. The point is that in many ways you were unknowingly much more Catholic. Yes, yeah. In your view of Scripture, your view of, of uh, the Trinity, your view sure. of uh, pro-life issues. Yeah, Th that's ironic. Although we were very conservative uh, and uh, not, uh, not too concerned with, with being friendly with other denominations and kind of keeping to ourselves and holding on to our tradition, in one way that did make us very Catholic because we preserved uh, uh, doctrines of the fathers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the general Catholic doctrine which we inherited way back in the tradition right. of the church uh, from when we broke away in the Reformation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's true. The, um, uh, what was your view then mm -hmm. of the Catholic Church growing up? Well, my, my view of the Catholic Church would be probably different than most uh, in my denomination because uh, growing up as a Navy chaplain, uh, my father uh, had many friends who were Catholic chaplains, so we had a lot of personal experience. And in, in the military, uh, Catholics outnumbered practicing Protestants, at least when I was growing up, by quite a large margin. Uh, so we usually had uh, maybe one Protestant service sandwiched between two Catholic masses at the, at the Navy chapel. And I, it's a funny thing I remember very distinctly, you know, being six years old and watching them strike the set and, and <laughs> set up the, the chapel for mass, you know, and they'd, they'd, uh, they, they took this Protestant blank cross that, that we had worshipped for, for in, in our service and they flipped around, there was a crucifix on the back, <laughs> and I was, just, I was shocked, you know, it had been there and I hadn't realized the whole time, but they, they'd flip it around and then they'd change some other things and bring out some vestments and they'd set it up for mass and then my friends from school would file in. Uh, and there'd be the Catholic worship there. So, uh, so we had a more friendly uh, feeling towards Catholic uh, Catholics because we had rubbed shoulders with them. And in fact, my dad was a good friend with uh, uh, Cardinal O'Connor before he was Cardinal Archbishop of New York. He was Chief of U.S. Navy Chaplains. My dad was on his staff. And in fact, wow. his his old Navy uniforms are in my mother's house uh, in Michigan. <laughs> really? This day. Wow. Yes. Wow. So, so you were um, friendly. Friendly. Yeah. But, yeah, but but they were ignorant, see. They just didn't know. They, 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 uh, they could cast off all the baggage. Right, and right, they, right. They, they, they really loved Jesus. Yeah, yeah. They, we had a sense that they loved the Lord, uh, but uh, they just weren't real, real well educated. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the feeling. All right. And yeah. the last thing you ever thought about was it was an option for you. Oh, definitely not. No, no. I knew too much. You know, we knew all, the, we knew all their errors very well. Well, even to a certain extent, because you were in the, the CRC, that really... You, had, you really didn't think of very many even other Protestant traditions as an no, option for you. No, not at that time. But, uh, but th that started to change when I, when I was applying for graduate school. Um, Why don't you start there? Because yeah, this is sure. where you start opening your heart yeah, to yeah. the church. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and uh, talk sure. about some of the things that started planting seeds for them. Yeah, well, wh what happened was, again, as I said, God accepted Notre Dame, wonderful blessing, you know, and uh, loved the place for the first time I... I set foot on it. I just felt, I literally had a physical sensation when I stepped foot on campus. Of something special about this, you know. Mm. So anyway, uh, w my wife and I went down. We had four children at the time. Uh, and this is part of the story. Uh, we had always been open to life. Um, uh, we had never contracepted. Uh, and I was taught that by my mother. Um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, prior to uh, 1930, this was a common agreement among all Christian denominations. And, uh, that was a tradition within our own, uh, our own denomination that my mother had preserved, and she said, no, you know, you should 
We let the Lord decide your children and so on. So we have four kids, my wife and I, and so we go, come down to Notre Dame with four kids and you're in graduate school, you're looking for the cheapest possible housing. <laughs> So that, it, that means the subsidized on-campus housing, which is very Spartan, uh, but cheap. You know? So we moved into the, uh, the married student housing called the University Village in Notre Dame. Well, who do you think are the other people looking for very cheap housing at Notre Dame? <laughs> it's all your, your practicing Catholic graduate students who are having children and following the church's teachings and so on. So all of a sudden, we find ourselves in this community of um, very articulate, very well-educated young Catholic couples uh, raising families and, and uh, living, the, living the church's life. And, um, and they started to, uh, started to talk to us. Uh, one figure in particular I'm very grateful for, um, uh, Michael Dauphiné, now a dean of the uh, faculty at Ave Maria University. Um, he uh, 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 struck me as a remarkable individual. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he had three qualities that I never thought I'd see in, uh, in one individual. Uh, he was clearly filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, he was highly intelligent, and he was Catholic. <laughs> and I didn't see how you could be all three things at once. <laughs> you know, I thought, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but maybe your elevator doesn't go to the top floor, so you, you stay in the Catholic Church. <laughs> or uh, maybe you're filled with the Holy Spirit and, um, uh, and you're highly intelligent, but then you would get out, you know. Uh, but, but being all, all three things, this, this just, it was like the burning bush in Moses. You know, it's like, how is this thing not consumed? How, is it, how does this person <laughs> not self-destruct? So uh, I, I was fascinated. So we, we started to have lunch uh, daily, uh, not, excuse me, not daily, weekly. Uh, we'd get together for lunch. Now, were you meeting with him to just try to and to talk. get him out or just, just to discover? To I, I made a, a rash vow. I said, either he's going to convert me or I'm going to convert him. <laughs> so, and I lost the wager, so be careful what you vow. So, anyway, I, I made this. I made this vow. I was like, we're gonna we're gonna go ma hand to hand combat here, and one of us is gonna win. So, we, we started to meet for lunch, and um, and I ran all my traditional uh, Protestant apologetics against him. Uh, and I was impressed as, with how he was able to answer from Scripture. And let me give you an example. Um, I was really incensed that all around me at Notre Dame there were references to Mary as Queen of Heaven. And so I shot him, you know, Mike, where do you get that in Scripture? And he said, well, have you never looked at Revelation 12? And I said, of course I read Revelation 12. I read, you know, Revelation th at least three times through. You know, what about Revelation 12? I said, well, let's, let's look at, at Revelation 12. So we turned there, and there in Revelation you've got, uh, Revelation 12, you've got, uh, the woman clothed with, this, with, the, with the, uh, the heavenly bodies, um, crowned with a crown of stars, so she's a, a queen, you know, um, queen of heaven because it's the heavenly bodies that she's clothed with, and then she gives birth to a male child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, I was in the Old Testament. I knew what that was. That's a reference to Psalm 2, the royal Davidic messianic psalm. This is talking about Jesus, talking about the son of David, the Messiah. And so Mike, Mike gets a little you know, playful with me and says, John, do we know any women in Scripture who give birth to Messiah? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay, don't be sarcastic with me, okay? Um, you know, he said, this is a reference to Mary, or at least you can argue that. And I thought, you know, this is very plausible. I remember, Marcus, I had grown up in many different Baptist churches which had elaborate schemes of the end times based on Revelation with multiple second comings of Jesus and, you know, the saints go up and then Jesus comes back and he brings up more and then the Russians invade everybody, you know. <laughs> and this, is all, this is all supposed to be exegesis of Revelation, you know, all these far-flung theories. And here a Catholic was making a very reasonable uh, uh, interpretation of Scripture uh, to support, you know, Mary as Queen of Heaven. I was very impressed with that. So he, he gave a lot of uh, scriptural basis for the church, but finally um, we, we reached an impasse where we simply could not solve things on the basis of scripture alone. And he pointed that out and he said, look, John, if we're just arguing on the basis of the Bible, we're not going to resolve this. And I said, you know, you're right. And I realized that even before I came to Notre Dame mm -hmm. in my graduate work. And uh, I said, so what do we do? And he suggested, why don't we look into the tradition of the church? And I thought, yeah, that's good. You know, maybe the, maybe the earliest uh, pastors and fathers of the church uh, would be in contact with the apostles and they would know what the apostles meant by some of the hard to understand passages. So uh, I'm going to break the, sure. in, in, in the sense, not going to break, but when you were in seminary, right? any time 
had you been challenged to examine these early fellows we, that knew the apostles? We, we kind of breezed through them. You know, I've always been surprised that I didn't know more about them. But I honestly, Marcus, when, by the time I was in my doctoral program, I did not realize that we had writings from the church fathers prior to the Council of Nicaea. Uh, I guess it's my bad because when I go back and look at my church history text, there was some some mention of them, but somehow that didn't get through to me. Right. That's so very was, common. I yeah. mean, it, it's me too. I mean, it's we so didn't. True. We certainly didn't read them, and I found out why we didn't read them <laughs> when I began to read them because <laughs> Mike started me reading them, and I, I read along with these guys, and I, I saw apostolic succession as a big point that they were stressing. I saw um, uh, the importance of the bishop, the importance of the Eucharist. No Eucharist was valid uh, aside from the permission of the bishop. And I thought, this is sounding very Catholic to me. You have Clement of Rome exercising authority over a church that's not nowhere near him out in, out in Corinth. Um, so this was, uh, you know, uh, very impressive to me. And finally, I'll tell you what got me, um, uh, Marcus, uh, and I even wrote it down because it's, it's so important to me, uh, and I want to get it exact, but I was reading in Ignatius of Antioch, in his letter to the Smyrnians. I was reading through his letters, got to Smyrnians, got to chapter 7, and I read these words, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. Now, you've got to understand the scene. 106 AD, Apostle John only been dead 10 years. Apostle John lived in Asia Minor, so the two had to have had contact. This is a man in touch with the apostles, heading to martyrdom in Rome. Okay, so, and, and this is what he's writing to the churches as he's being led in chains to Rome. He writes the Smyrnians, he says, Look at those men who have those perverted notions about the grace of Jesus Christ which has come down to us and see how contrary to the mind of God they are. They have no love for the poor. That's one point. They even abstain from the Eucharist and the public prayer because they will not admit that the Eucharist is the self-same body of our Savior Jesus Christ which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up again. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they are doomed in their disputatiousness. And Marcus, I read those three points, and I thought, you know what? He's talking about my denomination. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these, these were things that were problems. Um, a great love for the poor was something that we struggled with and were mm -hmm. having to overcome, mm -hmm. uh, not something that was natural to us. Point number two we denied that the Eucharist was the self-same body of Jesus Christ. In fact, we had to sign, a, 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 among other things, a statement endorsing that the Mass was a condemnable idolatry because in it you worship the bread and wine as if they were Jesus and they're not Jesus. Okay? So a, a denial that the Eucharist was Jesus was central to um, our doctrinal standards. Mm -hmm. And then as far as being doomed to disputatiousness, well, we're not the only ones that, are, that were doomed in that, but every year there were fights and break-offs and new denominations formed. And um, so it was as if, you know, Ignatius was reaching a hand up through time, up to me and going, wow, 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 saying, John, you are the problem, <laughs> okay? And, uh, and you need to change. You know, like he was calling me. Uh, into the unity of the Catholic Church. And um, I had a profound, this is about 2 a.m. I was, I was reading this, I can still see the scene. Um, and I, th I thought, you know what, uh, I, if the Eucharist is the body of Jesus, that is very important. And there's only one group that I could see teaching that. All Protestants denied it and the Catholic Church taught it. And that was the straw that broke, that broke my back. Um, and started me coming into the church. I'm going to have you back up a little bit because sure. I, I know from our previous conversation that, and you mentioned it a little bit ago, that you had already started to have a problem right. with sola scriptura. I did. Yes, that's true. I was doing a, a master's of theology at, um, at Calvin Seminary, and I was critiquing it, the biblical theology of another uh, Protestant Bible scholar. And he was a very liberal Protestant scholar, um, arguing biblical interpretations that were against the, the church's tradition. You know. And I would try to rebut his arguments, but I found that frequently it wasn't possible on the basis of Scripture alone to rebut his arguments. It was just my word against his word in terms of interpreting the same Bible passages. So I found myself in my master's thesis having to appeal again and again to the church's tradition 
in order to justify my interpretations over against his. And while I was doing that, I was uncomfortable doing it <laughs> because I knew <laughs> that my own group um, was not consistent about following church tradition. Uh, we accepted, for example, infant baptism somewhat on the basis of the tradition of the church, but we rejected other, other doctrines uh, from the early church. And to me, it seemed like a, a kind of a, an arbitrary grab bag. There were uh, a few doctrines that we picked up and we had to hold these, but you know, we deny the hierarchy, deny bishops, deny Eucharist, you know, those things. So kind of a, a cafeteria um, uh, hand-picking of, um, of doctrines out of the tradition that we followed. And I didn't have any coherent way of explaining why we did these ones and not the others. So you find yourself looking at tradition again. What about also something you even discovered later, and that was just the Bible itself. I mean, the, to a certain extent, the audacity of a, of a non-Catholic to even use the Scriptures yes. as their foundation. And why is that an audacious issue? Well, when you, when you study how we got the Bible, okay, uh, you find that, uh, uh, you know, the Bible as a single book um, starts to come together at the end of the 300s when, when the church had them, you know, came out of the catacombs, we could worship freely now in the Roman Empire, and now we could, you know, clean things up and do things right. Well, one of the things that was possible for the church to do was publish single books uh, that would have all the scriptures, you know, we had moving away from scrolls into what we call the codex, this book mm -hmm. format. Where this, yeah. So it became possible to have in one book all the scriptures, and so the church had to make a decision. What books go into this one book, this one Biblia that we're going to call the Bible? And so you see the church councils making those decisions at the end of the 300s. Uh, and what they're the books that they put in the Bible uh, were books were meant for reading at worship. It was meant for the liturgy. This was a liturgical book meant for Catholic worship. What can we read in church? That was the, the criteria for canonicity. It goes in the Bible if it may be read at church, read at Mass. Okay? Uh, so the church made a decision about what books may be read at Mass, and they based that decision on what had been the practice. They looked and said, what, well, what have we been reading at Mass? Uh, and they collected those books together, and they gave us a canon of the 27 New Testament books and the Old Testament books, including the seven so-called deuterocanonicals that, that are disputed by Protestants. Um, and that's how we got the Bible. It's a book for the liturgy based on what was read in the liturgy, uh, decided by the Catholic Church. So to take this book out of the liturgy, out of the church, uh, away from the tradition and so on, kind of pull it out of its context. Yeah. I mean, majority, I know I was in that, on that, in that ballpark, is I certainly accepted the infallibility, the inspiration of Scripture, mm -hmm. but I was blind to where I got that idea from. Right, right, yeah. I mean, so in and a certain a sense, the idea is good in terms of yeah. recognizing this as the Word of God. Right. But it's just that we had been blind to where that came from, that idea. Yeah, and, and I was in the same boat, and the, the, we're doing the same move, which is not realizing that really it was the church um, that taught us that this was the Word of God, you know. It was the church in a small c sense, and then ultimately it was the Catholic Church mm -hmm. that produced this book and handed it to believers and said, this is the Word of God, it is infallible and inerrant, because you don't find anything in the book that gives a list of what books belong in it, right. <laughs> or, or that says that it's infallible and inerrant in all its parts and so on. So we were trained by the church. So when we believe that the scriptures are infallible and inerrant, uh, we're actually making a prior move where, where we're putting trust in a church which taught us that. Mm -hmm. And we all actually make that move. So I would say the, if you believe in the infallible, fill, excuse me, the infallibility of Scripture, you're actually assuming the infallibility of the church behind that. As a uh, Christian Reformed, yeah. um, how did, not going with that argument, mm -hmm. what was the argument for why these particular books? Uh, the, the argument was, that, that, that it was obvious, it was somehow obvious that these books and not others belonged. Um, there was a, a statement in one of our confessions saying, you know, uh, even the ignorant can see that the things that take place therein are being fulfilled, you know. So, you know, well, it's just obvious, 
It's kind of like that. Yeah, I can't remember what but Calvin's quote on that was, but it was something like the Spirit gives witness, you know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I read it and the Spirit testifies to me. And, you know, there's some certain truth, right? The, the, scripture, the, the Spirit is active in scriptures, and, you know, so there's, there's certain truth to that, but that's not actually how the church decided what belonged in and, and what did not. Well, I remember it when, so that's what I believed and uh, from my Calvinist background from seminary was that, you know, it was the spirit that led the people in the church to recognize these books. We didn't talk about the authority of the church, but just the spirit leading and that idea that when you read it yourself, it's confirmed to you by the spirit. But then a Mormon missionary stopped by my door one day <laughs> and encouraged me to read the Book of Mormon and almost with the exact words. Yeah. Right. He said, you know, pray for the Holy Spirit. We'll help you understand that this book is scripture, the holding up the Book of Mormon. Right. And I'm thinking, I remember it hitting me. I mean, it put a crisis in my life. Yeah. Because that was the same argument that I used to convince others that this was a trustworthy book. Yes, yeah. I went through the same experience going, <laughs> going to the Mormon uh, temple in, in Oahu and uh, uh, hearing the same kind of line, you know, it was this inner warmth that, that you would experience if you, if you read it for yourself, yeah. Um, but that's not the way it went. That's right, very good. Yeah. Well, let's okay. take a break. Okay. We'll come back in a, in a moment with your questions for Dr. Bergsman. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, our guest is Dr. John Bergsma, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for sharing your journey. As, like I said, it's so much, I wish we had a two-hour program, there's so much we could go through on issues, but we'd love to take some of your calls and uh, emails. And uh, we've got uh, one here, Bill from Wisconsin. Dear Dr. Bergsma, as a Bible scholar, can you explain how the Reformed movement got, quote, hung up on the whole notion of predestination and what scriptural authority would you cite in support of the Catholic as opposed to the Calvinist theology of free will as it relates to predestination? A real easy question there, I thought. <laughs> and he did have a PS there. Did you know that Geronimo was Dutch reformed? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> but I'll store that away. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, so he's yeah. the, the predestination issue sure. and, yeah. uh, and, yeah. the, and the, yeah. the, the, the free yeah. will issue. Right. Well, um, uh, those are interesting questions, and we'll try to keep it at a basic level. Uh, th the idea is how did, how did the Reformed or Calvinist uh, movement get hung up on that? And it was from reading uh, some of St. Augustine's writings. Um, in St. Augustine, he has a very strong uh, teaching on predestination. Um, uh, that, uh, that Calvin picked up on and more or less um, uh, endorsed uh, uh, correctly, I would say, or close to it, okay, at least in some of Augustine's writings because Augustine varies a little bit on his opinions depending on what you're, you're reading from him. Now, um, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the, the Catholic Church allows latitude for your understanding of predestination. Um, you have uh, some groups, uh, for example, the Dominicans following uh, St. Thomas, um, who have a strong view of, of predestination that God really does uh, guide us into salvation actively. Okay? And uh, then you have uh, uh, another tradition within the Catholic Church represented by the Jesuits um, that say, no, it's not so much that, it's more God's foreknowledge. That's how we should understand predestination. God just knows in advance what you're going to do. Um, and that got to be a big dispute between the Dominicans and Jesuits, and it, uh, finally the Pope said, enough! <laughs> Nobody may argue about this, and he, he, he enforced a silence like a, like a good father with, with fighting children, saying, no, we're just not going to fight about this. 
so w within, within certain parameters established by the church, uh, you're free to have different understandings of what predestination is. But the Catholic Church does hold to predestination because it's, it's biblical. Now, exactly how you understand it uh, can vary. Um, uh, what, what the Catholic Church has always ruled out is the notion that uh, God actively sends people to hell. Um, that well, that's a very strong view of what we sometimes call double predestination. Mm -hmm. Now Calvin uh, comes close to endorsing that. Um, I, I'd have to um, punt to a Calvin scholar uh, on mm -hmm. that issue, but he comes close to that, and uh, that's been certainly our out. Calvinists that do yeah, that, that, far. that do feel yeah. that strongly. And the, the Canons of Dort, uh, one of the doctrinal standards. Uh, comes pretty close to saying, you know, God impels some people towards damnation. Hmm. Um, I've said this on the program before, but I'll get your opinion on this view when it comes to these issues. Would you say that one of the major differences between the Catholic view of predestination and free will and the Calvinist view is that Catholics are much more comfortable with the both and, mm -hmm. whereas the Calvinists really, it's, it's an either or issue when it comes to God's sovereignty, man's free will, God predestined us. I mean, they really have a hard time kind of allowing yeah, a both. Integrating that, yeah, yeah. W within within the Calvinist tradition, uh, you do you get do get among some uh, such an emphasis on God's sovereign will that it makes us seem passive. Uh, now, nobody's going to say, "Oh, therefore you shouldn't make any decisions on your own." But it, it tends in that you know, mm. it tends to encourage in some quarters a kind of passivity. Um, not so much in, in my former group anymore because, you know, um, it's, it's becoming absorbed into American Protestantism. But, um, but, but you, you did have that. Whereas St. Thomas says, you know, you know, God can move us in such a way that we are freely uh, acting as well and that there can be a harmony between the divine and human will. And that's how I understand predestination uh, to this day. All right. Thank you very yeah. much. Let's take our first caller, David from Missouri. Hello, David. What's your question? I don't have a question, Marcus, but I got a comment. I've, uh, I'm the fourth time caller, and uh, let me try this other phone here. <laughs> this is the first, fourth time I've called you, and I converted this Easter Vigil night. Well, I'm a home. former Assembly of God, I uh, went to Christian Church, um, but it's, this was so powerful, it's just, I can't imagine, I'm watching your program so much, and Paul Carapi and uh, Jim, uh, our uh, Mike Cumby, and all the people at the St. Patrick's Church and where I go to, has just tr been tremendous. The, cause my prayer has been, God confirm it and validate it, because you know, my strong Assembly of God background has been really an influence in my life. Uh, baptism was wonderful, the, the taking their first communion, but Easter morning when I uh, took the, the body of Christ, then the man said to me, the blood of Christ, he looked me in the eye, I looked him in the eye, I stopped the whole procession behind me, I just stared into that chalice, <laughs> and saw the blood of Christ, and I sipped it, and the Holy Spirit nailed both of us, <laughs> and I was validated, confirmed, and I'm just telling everybody would listen, I've been dying to tell you about this, this, that, and I said, uh, <laughs> I almost wrecked my truck trying to get to church that one time. <laughs> well, David, welcome home, and thanks for calling us. Uh, I know from the notes there that you're, that you were on the prompter that you're a regular viewer, and that the journey home was an encouragement to you, so, uh, it's, it's an honor uh, yeah. that the Lord be able to, to help our stories be an encouragement to your journey. So welcome home. Thanks for calling us, Dave. Let's take our next email. This is from Matt. Uh, Dear Dr. Bergsma, did you always accept the reality of our Lord's presence, body, blood, soul, divinity in the Eucharist? If not, when did you accept this faith? Uh, that's an excellent question, Marcus. Uh, no, I absolutely did not. Um, I had a symbolic, symbolic view of the Eucharist. Uh, that it, it was just mere symbols. Um, uh, I can remember very clearly helping to uh, uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper at, at, in my old church, and uh, after it was over, we just threw all the bread and wine away. And uh, one of the elders said, isn't this strange? We just called this, uh, I remember this incident, just called this the body and blood of Jesus, and now we're tossing it in the trash can. I was like, ah, oh, you're Catholicizing. You, know, you just understand, this is just symbolic. You know, <laughs> you know. Um, and I kind of rebuked him for his, uh, his uh, Catholicizing ways. Um, but uh, 
I came to accept it again after reading Ignatius of Antioch, what I just read, and this is my logic. This man is living uh, 10 years after the death of the Apostle John. The Apostle John is still warm in the grave. This man had to have known the apostolic teaching about the Eucharist. And after reading uh, Ignatius saying, you know, beware of those who deny that it's the self-same body of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I went back to the Gospel of John. I started reading the Gospel of John, John chapter 6, where Jesus is saying, uh, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. My, my flesh is food indeed. My, my blood is drink indeed. And the, the, you know, I am the bread which came down from heaven. I read all those statements. And I thought to myself, if I was a first century Christian reading this without having been primed by some kind of you know, Protestant mm -hmm. polemic, if I was just a first century Christian reading this for the first time, would I take this symbolically or would, it, would I take it at face value? And I said, you know what, I would take this at face value. And didn't the Apostle John know that those reading him would take him at face value? And then you got confirmation that Ignatius of Antioch reflects that kind of interpretation. It just simply is the body of Jesus, not, a, not just a symbol. That, that won me over and that was the domino that started the rest falling. Let me ask you a pastoral question. Sure. Because this is sometimes true of, of especially well-trained converts in that they believe that it was symbol for so long mm -hmm. that when they come into the church and recognize intellectually the reality of it, uh -huh. it still takes a long time mm -hmm. to work through that long baggage yeah. to realize. Mm -hmm. Is that true for you, or no? I, you know, I can see how it would be, but uh, but for me, you know, uh, you know, praise God in the way I was raised. God is sovereign. You know, that was especially <laughs> emphasized. <laughs> right, of you course, know? God was sovereign. He could do anything, and so I, I said, if if God wants this to be the the body of His Son Jesus Christ, it is. You know, God can declare that to be the case. And so I had no problem, you know, once believing that because of my, my confidence in the almighty power of God. So no, once, once the intellectual thing was there, it, 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 came, it came quickly. And I thought the only objections I have are kind of rationalist objections, kind of like, well, that, that's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. <laughs> so I, I couldn't find any scriptural, any faith-based reasons not to accept that, especially if it's in scripture. It's in the early church fathers. Yeah, Very case good. closed. Very good. Very good. Next caller, Dan from Michigan. Hello, Dan. What's your question? Yes. Well, I happen to work in Grand Rapids, Michigan. <laughs> I'm a Catholic that works at a Christian Reform institution, and uh, one of the few of, of them. And, but I have to say, they're wonderful people to work for. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm very grateful for them. They're, yes. They've been wonderful. The question that I have is um, more of how do you know, how do I continue as a Catholic to, to reflect an understanding of God that at least gives, cr lends credibility um, to the, our journey as Christians? I mean, what I'm trying to say is how do I help subside the suspicion of Catholicism? I mean, regarding around the regarding Eucharist, regarding Mary, regard, um, I have had some of the CRC people come up to me and want me to take them to, to the Stations of the Cross. and. And, and, and pray that with them, which I have, and, and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's um, but some of them, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of that distant suspicion, not all, yeah. just some of them. I just want to know how, from your perspective, how would one look at that? Dan, thank, thank you, and, and bless you in your, uh, in your witness there. Thank you so yeah. much. Th that's, that's an ex excellent question, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the believers he's talking about, my old denomination, wonderful people, and I got I got to emphasize that you know that uh, brothers in Christ, and I'm so grateful uh, for for my education and training in those institutions in in Grand Rapids. Um, but the, but the question is very good, and uh, what I recommend um, uh, to Dan is um, that he talk about his faith um, and. Uh, uh, invite people to mass. Um, this is something that that uh, that a Catholic friend of mine did when I, when I was a was a, a pastor in, in Grand Rapids. Um, I had a, a friend from the neighborhood who was a devout Catholic, and she kept inviting me to come to to her church, and I did. Um, and it 
uh, you know, I, I witnessed a very uh, you know, powerful movement of the spirit among these Catholics at Mass, and it helped to break down a lot of the stereotypes that I had. And I think that there's widespread ignorance outside the Catholic Church about what Catholics believe, what they're like, and befriending uh, Protestants, inviting them, come and witness, you know, see what we actually do. A lot of Protestants are very surprised at how much scripture we read <laughs> at Mass, um, a great deal. The Easter Vigil, <laughs> seven <laughs> readings <laughs> from the Old Testament, and then a couple from the New Testament as well, you know, very scripturally based. Um, so I think inviting people to Mass, inviting people to read the Catechism, there are these gross caricatures of what Catholics actually think, and I keep telling people, look, the Catechism is available at every bookstore and online. Why don't you go and read it for yourself, and you'll see that you know these these caricatures aren't so so true. So, invite people to church and encourage them to read the Catechism. Uh, talk about your faith. Uh, make it clear that you love Jesus. Um, you know, pray openly and comfortably with other people. I think these are all ways to break down those barriers. All right. Thank you very much. Let's see another email from Adela in Maryland. Uh, dear Marcus and guest, I am a lifelong Protestant and I find myself feeling more and more drawn to Catholicism. I watch your show every week and I really enjoy it. Thank you, uh, Adelia. Well, uh, glad you're watching the show. Uh, can you tell me why Protestants reject the seven books that are in the Catholic Bible but not in the Protestant Bible? Thank you, Adela. Okay. This is an excellent question, Marcus. Why? Why are they rejected? Um, well, uh, 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 we have to go back to the early centuries. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in the time of Christ, um, uh, the Jews had not actually uh, come to a final decision about what books were in what we would call the Old Testament. Okay? Uh, some generations after, uh, after the church was started, the Jews finally made a decision. Uh, and they opted for a smaller canon or a smaller list of Old Testament books, excluding the seven books that we accept as Catholics, the Deuterocanonicals. Well, in the early church, some of the church fathers were influenced by Jewish views. So St. Jerome, for example, um, disputed uh, the seven Deuterocanonical books, and he personally didn't uh, think that they were in the Old Testament. Now, we have to understand that St. Jerome spent years studying Hebrew from rabbis in Palestine. So he was inf influenced by their views of canon. Now, f the most of the rest of the church um, uh, had a broader understanding of what books belonged, and that was rep represented by St. Augustine. St. Augustine, in his writings, uh, his work on Christian doctrine, gives us the whole canon that the Catholic Church has always held since, and that was endorsed by several church councils that were within the lifetime of St. Augustine and reaffirmed by councils at, at Florence and at, finally at Trent. Now, um, back to uh, why do Protestants reject them? Well, in the course of the Reformation, one of the, pro one of the uh, Catholic doctrines that, uh, that Martin Luther took issue with was uh, prayers for the dead. And this is supported by um, the Book of Maccabees. Um, and one of the, in the heat of debate, uh, one of the moves that, that Luther made was to say, well, the book of Maccabees, according to St. Jerome, isn't in the Bible at all. Uh, so he tried to remove that from Scripture following St. Jerome, um, and uh, with it, the rest of the so-called Deuterocanonicals that Jerome uh, uh, disputed. So basically, the Protestants opted for this smaller canon, which had never been endorsed by a church council um, mm -hmm. prior you know, in, in the history of the church. Only a few of the fathers had endorsed it. Uh, and the rest of the church, the Catholic Church, followed St. Augustine, some of the other fathers, and the actual conciliar decisions from the early church as well as Florence and Trent. So uh, does that make sense? I don't yeah, know if yeah, I, that's yeah. a lot of stuff. You know, no, we a, go over this in Bible class a, all the time. Yeah, and it's <laughs> a lot there. There's so much to deal with there. I mean, it, it wasn't a done deal. I mean, mm -hmm. when the King James Version was established 1611, yeah, it had they, all the books. They translated them, yeah. yeah. They were all there. I mean, it was not a clear issue, um, and of course there was a connection with the Septuagint also was another big part of that, which you, you just touched on. But uh, go to the web, EWTN's website, mm -hmm. there's lots of articles about this very thing and some books in the religious catalog that you can uh, you can check up on. There's one, um, uh, How We Got the Bible. How We Got the Bible yes. is a great one. Yeah. Um, but there's also one, I think it's uh, by Greg, 
Oh, I'm, I'm pulling a blank right now. Uh, it's not by Greg Otis. It's uh, uh, one of the former guests on the program. <laughs> he's he's going to kill me the next time he sees me because I can't remember. Right now I'm pulling a blank on his name, but he's got a wonderful book on the Deuterocanonicals, why those books aren't in the Bible. If you go to the EWTN website, go to chnetwork.org website, you can find the book. And uh, it's a great book that covers the whole issue that I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'm about to read this. My mind isn't. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't have to worry about my memory. Laura Jean from Michigan writes Dear guest, how did your extended family in the CRC tradition respond to your joining the Catholic Church? I live here in West Michigan, Holland. Go Hope, she writes, yeah. with deep family roots in the CRC slash RCA tradition and joined the church last Easter. Do you have any words of wisdom in helping my family, but most importantly my parents understand that my being Catholic really is not turning my back on my family and familial tradition, familiar history. Are there any books that you can recommend? Thanks, Laura. Well, uh, I can recommend books, but the question is will they read them? Uh, and I did not have much success getting uh, family members to read, although my mother, uh, God bless her, <laughs> read quite a bit. And one of my brothers did read quite a number of things I, I sent. Uh, what I encouraged my family members to read was Stephen Ray's Crossing the Tiber, uh, mm -hmm. where he gives his conversion story and also gives the, the Church Fathers on baptism and Eucharist. Um, uh, another book that, that my uh, brother uh, found very helpful was uh, David Curry's book, uh, Born Fundamentalist, Born Again uh, uh, Catholic. Uh, that was influential in my, my one brother's uh, conversion. Um, so I can recommend those two, two books uh, if, if they're open to reading. Okay? Uh, if they're not open to reading, it's very difficult, um, and all you can do is pray, love, um, Try not to argue, but also, um, you know, be willing to talk. Um, it show show your family that uh, uh, that you love the Lord, um, and that's really a love for Jesus that brought you into the church, um, and and not some other factor. Now, as far as my how my own pr uh, family uh, reacted, it, you had a wide spectrum. Uh, uh, some were indifferent. Um, <laughs> some thought I was just nuts and wrote me off as a little brother that, you know, was crazy and trying to be rebellious. Uh, but interestingly, my, my one brother who gave me the hardest time, and, uh, and I remember uh, I told him on, on, uh, on Christmas uh, night that we, were going, that we were going to, my wife and I were going to midnight mass because we had decided to become Catholics, and he said, what? After, after 500 years since the Reformation, you're going to leave and give up on all this tradition? <laughs> he says, 500 years of tradition and you're throwing it out the door to go back to Rome, he says. <laughs> anyway, he got very incensed, but, uh, but to his credit, he read the stuff that I sent him and, uh, and we talked via email and then a year after I came into the church, he was received at the Easter wow. Vigil wow. in uh, Kalamazoo, God. Michigan. Yeah. All right, excellent. Real quick, one more email. Sure. Uh, Chris from Ohio. What does inerrancy of Scripture mean? Okay. Uh, inerrancy of Scripture means that the, the Bible is free uh, from all error, uh, to put it bluntly. Now, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when talking about the inerrancy of Scripture is that uh, you have to know what did the author mean to communicate. And what trips a lot of people up is uh, a tendency to assume that the, uh, the biblical author is always speaking literally. Uh, frequently, the, the biblical author is speaking in a poetic fashion. Uh, for example, um, uh, Genesis chapter 1, uh, when we talk about the seven days of creation, it, it could be literal, but you also have to be open to the possibility that the author of Genesis is speaking to us in a poetic uh, uh, way. And so the church allows us uh, to hold uh, the position that you know the the, uh, the world was not created in seven literal days that the author is speaking to us figuratively. Um, so the Bible is free from error, but you have to understand that frequently biblical authors are speaking in a non-literal fashion, and we get guidance from the church uh, as to when they're speaking literally and when not. And that's really the the danger of sola scriptura because you're left right. on your own to decide right. whether. And it's you, often well, seriously, not you know, do you cut your hand off, you know, right. because it's sin? Do you sin? gouge out your eye? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's difficult to say. So you come up with an explanation, oh, that's hyperbole. Well, but what authority yeah. do you decide that it is right. hyperbole? Right. Yeah, there you are. You know, you know what, what if that's central to the faith? <laughs> Real quick, a couple seconds left. Sure. Some people are watching from your background. What should you say to encourage them to come home? 
Well, I'd say first of all, um, pray more, uh, get involved with your church, and especially with, with leading uh, in the church, because I think that on all of our spiritual journeys, the more involved we are in our, in our local uh, church, the more we come to realize what the church is, and God can use that to, to communicate with you. The other thing I would say to you is, um, uh, uh, do you care whether um, uh, uh, your denomination believes what the early Christians did? And if you care. Dr. John? Yes. I've got to say, thank you so all much right. for joining us. <laughs> uh, okay. God bless you all. Thank you for joining all us right. on the okay. journey home. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.